Thank you, Harold. Good morning. Welcome to Cleveland Park Congregational United Church of Christ. We are an open and affirming congregation committed to racial justice. Whoever you are and wherever you are on life's journey, you're welcome here. And I'd like to congratulate all of you for remembering to reset your clocks last night. <laughs> And well, that's true. They do reset themselves, although I still have a few I have to change. Um, and it's also great that you made it through these fierce winds this morning. <laughs> so let's hope it calms down a little bit. If you're visiting with us today, we're really glad that you're here. And we invite you to sign our guest book so that we can keep in touch with you. And also, you're welcome to join us for coffee hour after the service. We have a number of announcements, and I will draw your attention to what's in the bulletin. The first thing I want to mention is that um, we take up some special collections um, a few times during the year. And this morning, we're collecting for one great hour of sharing, which is a UCC initiative that collects money for international partners to provide um, sources of clean water, food, emergency relief, health care, et cetera. You can read more about it on, in your bulletin. And if you're one of the few people that still uses checks, you can write a check out to our church with OGHS in the memo line, or you can go on to our website and donate there. This afternoon, there is an online webinar or workshop, I should say, from two to five, that's called Navigating Controversial Conversations. It seems like an important topic these days, so if you're interested in that, there's information about how to register in the bulletin. On Tuesday, the book group will be meeting. They're going to be discussing Still Life by Sarah Winman. And Christians for Ceasefire are continuing um, some of their activities. And there are two online events that you can read about in the bulletin today. And just a reminder for next Sunday that the council will be meeting after church. And later that day, the poetry group and the faith life group will be meeting. And so I'm going to turn things back over to Pastor Ellen and just remind you to mute your electronic devices. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Good morning, everyone. It is good to see you this fourth Sunday of Lent. We're now halfway through and moving toward Easter. And many thanks to David for this gorgeous forsythia on the chancel this morning. So I too want to thank you for coming this morning after missing an hour's sleep. Um, it's a little harder for our families with young children. So I see that rather than 10 up front for our time for all ages, um, Stella, Star, we are so glad you are here. <laughs> Woohoo! Um, I also want to thank all the lay leaders who participated in yesterday's leadership retreat, especially those of you who showed up again this morning. It was a good afternoon of connection, learning, brainstorming, even some fun. And I am truly grateful to have so many dedicated volunteers in our congregation. It takes a village to make our community run. This morning, we'll continue our Lenten worship theme, The Body Remembers, with a focus on healing. What is healing? What is cure? What are we asking for when we ask God to heal us? We begin this morning's service by lighting candles of hope and healing for the world. May this light illumine all places, beings, and situations without exception, near and far. Sometimes it takes a while for the light to come, but it does. Please join me for the call to worship. Though I have seen ruin, though I have felt pain, though I have seen rain, though I have known thirst, And together we pray, God, you are a balm for all our wounds. We have each known illness, injury, and pain. 
We have each known a desire for healing. Help us to follow what takes us apart to the place where it turns us again toward wholeness. Help us to trace the line of uncertainty to where it becomes steady ground. Remind us that to have faith is to use our whole life to tell the story. And reassure us that every life has its broken bits. Every life has its beauty. Amen. Please rise in body and or spirit as you are able for our opening hymn found on page 501. <laughs> During the season of Lent, we're centering the need for confession. Not because any of us is particularly horrible, but because none of us is perfect. We've each fallen short of loving God, our neighbor, ourselves, and our planet. And when we humbly confess, when we truly want to start fresh, when we go home this afternoon and make even one small change in our lives, it matters to the world and to our own small selves. And so I invite you this morning into confession. Oh God, there is so much around us that drains our hope.
Oh God, too often we confuse healing with cure. Oh God, it's hard to trust when we see and feel so much pain. I now give you a moment for your own silent and private confessions. So let your souls receive this rest. May the God who understands our pain ease it and any shame about it. May we be released from our need for certainty and open to the grace of not knowing. May our hearts be heard and our prayers be answered, if only to assure us we are not alone. And may we be forgiven, O oh God, thinking you are not there if we don't get exactly what we pray for. Amen. And now held in the arms of our God, we pray. Holy healer, how be thy name. and love of God with your neighbor in the pew. May be, peace be with each one of you. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Peace. <laughs> it's good to see you all this morning. And you. Okay, great. <laughs> Lee says peace to peace all of you. Peace be with everyone. Peace be with you, Mom. Peace. Peace with you, Ellen and Mike and Mary, Nicholas, and all the rest of you. Peace, Don. <laughs> Great. So, if all of those online could remute. Well, hello, Alicia. Hello. <laughs> okay, and um, as I said earlier, we have a greatly diminished crowd this morning of um, younger people in our congregation, but Star, I would love to have you come up, and Jane and Marion, if you'd like to join her, I'm sure she'd feel so supported. And anyone else, of course, absolutely. 
Oh, and we actually have two people. Would you like to introduce your friend? This is Samantha, did you say? Samantha, okay, great name. Great name. Okay, so we have Samantha, we have Star, we have Marianne, and we have Jane. Jane, I haven't seen you in a while. It's good to see you. I know you've been here. I just haven't seen you. So um, for those of you who don't know, Jane is um, an intern who has been working to assist the Sunday School Program Coordinator, who is, of course, Marianne. And so we're very glad to have her, especially on Sundays when there are a lot more small people, <laughs> right? But that's okay, because you know what? It's not the numbers, it's the, there you go. It's the quality, quality not quantity. All right, so. Uh, well, yeah, because hello, you lost time last night, right? And you still, st and yet you still made it. You're sleepy, well, of course you're sleepy. Is Samantha sleepy? Oh, she, whoops. She basically sleeps all day because I can't actually take her to any, where like, you know. To school. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> kind of like a cat. She gets about 16 hours of sleep every day. 16 hours of sleep a day, okay, all right. Well, so it sounds like um, you might need some help this morning, and that's what we're gonna talk about right now, is needing help, all right? Do any of you ever need help up here, including Samantha? Uh, I sometimes need help doing stuff and Samantha needs help walking. Okay, <laughs> that's fair. Uh, lying down. So okay. Uh, okay, how about, I'm going to hand up, but I'm not running back and forth. Um, how about the two of you? Do you ever need help? Uh, yeah, um, for my job, I like move really heavy trees. And so it's really important to ask for help when you need it as to not fall over with the tree. That is, oh. <laughs> I, I absolutely affirm the need for that. It's, How about you, Jane? Um, I also need help, like at school, I'll need help sometimes with my work and other things. Um, and sometimes when things aren't really going my way, I need help like staying positive as well. Okay, so. yeah, that's, that's, that's honest, I like that, yes. How about the rest of you? Is there anybody here that ever needs help? Is there, uh, maybe I'll put it the other way. Is there anybody here that never needs help? Okay, I'm, you're all being honest. I'm really glad to hear that. All right, so the next question is, and Marion answered this in part, um, where do you go for help when you need help? Marion said you ask for like help from coworkers, I guess is what you meant. How about you, Jane? Where do you go for help when you need help? Um, I'll ask like my friends or like my parents, my family, um, just like people in my life who I know I can trust to help me. Okay, so family and friends and very importantly, people you know you can trust. Yeah, how about you, Star? Where uh, do you go for help? Usually, if I need help with something actually like physical, then I'll probably just be like to the nearest person in the room, hey, can you help me do this? But if I'm feeling really sad, then I'll get my mother or my father and we'll, you know, talk. Okay. All right. So, and presumably those are people you trust. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thankfully. Thankfully. <laughs> thankfully, that is not always the case, I know. And so thankfully that is true for you. So, um, are there ever things that you feel like, gosh, I really, I can't, I can't really, I need help, but I can't really share this with anyone else. Like, I'm really struggling inside, but I just, right now, like maybe later I could share it with someone else, but right now I just, I can't. Does that, has that ever happened to you or does it ever happen to you? Yeah, I mean, at school, if there isn't, really a solution if if you if you're injured then you go down to the nurse right if you need help with schoolwork then you raise your hand but if you're feeling really sad then there's not really anything you can do you can ask to go to the like the school counselor but that doesn't really you know it's not the school counselor isn't very helpful i guess it's just because it's you don't really know them that well they're just, yeah. and they see like 
20 kids a day or something. Also, they're not available very often. So it sounds like you don't really have a relationship with that person, and it's a little hard to trust somebody that you don't have a close relationship with. How about Marianne and Jane? Does that ever happen to you when you're not quite sure, like, if there's anybody you could really go to? Yeah, that does happen. Um, something I'll do is kind of wait on it and go to bed, and sometimes it's better in the morning. And if not, sometimes I've thought about who I can talk to. Mm -hmm. so. How about you, Jane? Um, yeah, that has happened to me before. I kind of do a similar thing. Um, you know, I'll wait on it a little bit. I'll try to like work it out myself um, and think about like options of like people who I can talk to once I feel better about it. Yeah. So when you're in that space where you're sort of like, oh, I can't really talk to the school counselor or oh, I'm feeling kind of bad, maybe I'll go to sleep or, you know, oh, maybe I'll think of a bunch of whole, a bunch of people that later I can talk to. Do you ever think about praying or talking with God? Honest, it's, you know, we're, we're just looking for honesty. I bet a lot of us don't do that. I bet a lot of us forget that we can actually sort of offer it up, really, you know? Like, I'm not saying, when I say this, I'm not saying that God is gonna do exactly what you want. Like, I don't actually believe that, and I'll be preaching a bit about that. But I do think that God can be with us in it, and that's a different thing, you know? That when we're needing somebody that we can trust, that we want to be in relationship with, so that we can feel just a little bit more supported or maybe comforted, I do think that that is who and what God can be for us. It's just that sense that we are not alone, that God is with us. And even if we just want to get a little bit quiet and go inside and just find that place inside where we feel some steadiness and a sense that we're okay, wherever that is inside us, and just stay there for a little bit. For me, that's God holding us. I actually thought of somebody, yeah. but they're not always available. Okay. Um, I have a step cousin named Leela. Okay. And she's about my same age, and we go through a lot of the same things. Excellent. Um, we both deal with, you know, like really annoying, mean kids at school. We're we're both dealing with growing up, where both our parents are divorced. And we just, like, we go through so much of the same thing that it's not, we don't really come, I mean, we comfort each other, but it's not like, you know, we make it better. We just go through it together. We go and through it together. You're with one another. I mm -hmm. love that for you, Star. I love that for you. But she lives in California, so. Can you talk on the phone? Well, I mean, yeah, but also there's a really big time difference. Oh, and yeah. Um, well, we, she has school, you know, yeah. Yes. on weekdays too. <laughs> All right, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close us by saying just a quick prayer, okay? So I'm going to start right here in the middle. Um, can I put my arm around you? Yes, sir. Okay, of cool. Course. Can I put my arm around you, Marion? Thank you. <laughs> can I touch you? Jane, thank you. All right. Connecting and connecting and healing God, my prayer for all of us is that we will have at least one person who understands what we're going through and can be with us in it. And God, if we don't even have that one person, help us to trust that you are with us in it and that we can take a breath and rest in knowing we are not alone. Amen. Okay, have a great time downstairs. Bye, Samantha. <laughs> Margaret will now read from the Gospel of Matthew. <laughs> Our reading this morning is from the ninth chapter of Matthew, verses 18 to 26. While he was saying these things to them, 
Suddenly a leader came up and knelt before him, saying, My daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her, and she will live. And Jesus got up and followed him with his disciples. Then suddenly a woman who had been suffering from a flow of blood for 12 years came up behind him and touched the fringe of his cloak. For she was saying to herself, If I only touch his cloak, I will be made well. Jesus turned, and seeing her, he said, Take heart, daughter. Your faith has made you well. And the woman was made well from that moment. When Jesus came to the leader's house and saw the flute players and the crowd making a commotion, he said, Go away, for the girl is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But when the crowd had been put aside, he went in and took her by the hand, and the girl got up. And the report of this spread through all of that district. Thank you, Margaret. How many of you have ever been prayed over? Okay, awesome, Harold. So you know what I'm talking about. I mean, some of you raised your hands, some of you didn't, and some of you look confused. And that's okay. To clarify, in some Christian circles, if someone is sick or disabled or in any sort of crisis or in need of saving, Harold, People pray over them, meaning they ask God to heal the person and claim this will give God the glory. In other words, if God heals by which they mean cures, we can believe. Now, it won't come as a surprise to you that I'm not in line with this. It's not that I don't think we should pray for one another, as I just talked about, or that we shouldn't pray for healing. I just don't think healing is the same as curing, or that God picks and chooses who gets to be cured based on who's prayed over, or that God cares about being given the glory. Let's begin with the gospel story Margaret just read. Accounts of the healing of the bleeding woman and raising of the dead child occur in all three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Matthew's account is the shortest, but in all three, the primary details remain the same. A woman has been hemorrhaging, assumed vaginal bleeding, for 12 years, and a 12-year-old child slash woman, because in traditional Judaism, 12 is the age when a girl becomes a woman, has died. In both cases, cultural and religious stigma has rendered them unclean. A woman who was bleeding wasn't allowed out in public, certainly not touching other people, in fact, after each menstruation, a woman had to ritually cleanse herself before others could touch her. As for the child woman, dead people were ritually unclean as well. No one would have wanted to touch either of these female bodies. I present these stories together, as did all three of the synoptic gospel writers, because they complement one another. However, I'm going to focus on the bleeding woman. What is it like to endure chronic and or ongoing illness in a culture that makes you an outcast and untouchable because of it? I'm not talking about first century Roman occupied Palestine. What is it like today in our own society to experience a chronic health condition, any health condition that isn't acute and resolvable? What is it like to live with diabetes, arthritis, or high blood pressure? What is it like to live with cancer, long COVID, or depression? What is it like to live with cerebral palsy, autism, or Down syndrome? What is it like to live as just plain old? It's hard to say, because we don't usually talk about it. We have a myth of normal and we go about perpetuating it. We find it boring if people focus on their health conditions. We find it frustrating and perplexing if they can't find a relatively quick fix for them. And if we're really honest, we feel a bit judgmental. 
wondering what they could have done to prevent said conditions and or keep them from continuing. Which is to say, if we're the ones suffering, we probably judge ourselves as well. But why? What's so off-putting about mortal human bodies, meaning bodies that are one day going to completely break down and die, breaking down a bit in the process? Is it that we fear these bodies because we know they could be our own? Is it that we really do think if the person, someone else, or ourself were somehow just better, or had more faith, or worked harder to get healed, or I don't know, prayed harder, that they, we, wouldn't still be sick? Are we all, even if we've never even heard these Bible stories of healing, because we all grew up in a culture implicitly informed by them, laboring under the delusion that if we just believed, we'd be cured. That as Jesus said to the bleeding woman, our faith would make us well. I think the answer is to some degree, yes. We do think this. We do think if we just prayed more or tried harder or found the right doctor or went to the right guru or did the right thing, we'd be okay. Or the person next to us would be okay or our son, or daughter, or friend, or husband, or wife, or father, or mother, or would be okay. But what if these Bible stories have less to do with the person healed and more to do with the person healing? What if these stories are more about Jesus' response and less about the result of his actions? Think about it. These stories are about women, and not just women, but untouchable women, bleeding and dead women. And Jesus doesn't say, sorry, you're ritually unclean, I can't help you. He doesn't freak out because a bleeding woman touched his coat, and believe me, another man would have. He doesn't say, sorry, your daughter's already dead, go bury her. No. He affirms the woman who touches his cloak. Daughter, your faith has made you well. He goes to the child woman who has died and took her by the hand. What if the point of these stories isn't that the woman's bleeding stopped or that the child was raised from the dead? What if the point of these stories is that Jesus didn't judge or ostracize or disregard or discard them because of their conditions? He saw the woman who was bleeding. He went in to the woman child who was dead. Even so, for me, the stories are still problematic, at least the way they've informed our culture, because they encourage us to believe healing is the same as cure, which it's not. As Resma Menekin writes, in today's America, we tend to think of healing as something binary. Either we're broken or we're healed from that brokenness. But that's not how healing operates, and it's almost never how human growth works. More often, healing and growth take place on a continuum with innumerable points between utter brokenness and total health. We are all on this continuum. We're each at some point, a point that changes from day to day, year to year, age to age, between utter brokenness and total health. And if total health is our only stand-in for acceptability, well then most of us are going to be unacceptable most of the time. Back to the difference between healing and cure. But this is the biggest problem I have with the praying over phenomenon. I'll tell you a story. Many years ago, one of my brothers and his wife asked if they could pray over one of my boys. I knew what they meant because I know their religious proclivities, but I was more conflict avoidant then than now, and I figured, well, it can't hurt to pray. So I said yes. Also, my son was asleep. 
while they prayed, take away all infirmity, heal him for the glory of God, etc., etc. And as they were praying, I got madder and madder. Who were they to decide there was something wrong with my child? Who were they to think God was somehow elevated by making my child more normal? Who were they to conflate healing with curing? Etc., etc. But it was good because it got me thinking. And it informed how I see all this today. There's nothing wrong with any of us. We are each beautiful children of God, and we each need healing because each one of us is both broken and beautiful. But healing isn't the same as cure. Healing doesn't mean I wake up tomorrow and have no arthritis in my left thumb or a platelet count in the normal range. Healing doesn't mean you wake up tomorrow and have no cancer. Healing doesn't mean your sister wakes up tomorrow and no longer craves alcohol. Healing doesn't mean another of my sons wakes up tomorrow and no longer lives with debilitating chronic fatigue. Healing doesn't mean your friend wakes up tomorrow and no longer has an eating disorder. Because each of these results would be cures. And friends, as Kate Bowler says, there is no cure for being human. No cure for being mortal. All we have is healing. So what is healing? A distinction I've heard is that curing means eliminating all evidence of disease, while healing means becoming whole. So I'd amend this to say healing is movement toward wholeness, meaning healing is a verb, whereas cure is a static noun. Let me be more specific. Healing can occur with or without the possibility of cure. One can have terminal cancer and still engage in healing, because healing is not about preventing death. We all die. Newsflash, we all die. Healing is about enhancing life. Healing is about growing relationships, cultivating gratitude, experiencing resilience, becoming more of the person you and only you can be. Healing isn't dependent on physical or even mental health. Healing is about moving toward greater wholeness of mind, body, spirit. And if one of those parts isn't well, the other parts can support it. I mean this both within ourselves and within community because healing requires community. Healing requires that we each play our part and support the other parts. Healing requires us to see one another. Healing requires us to enter in. Healing requires us to meet each other where we are and affirm and acknowledge that we are each whole human beings, along with our broken bits. For me, this is the image of human and communal life I'm committed to hold. And I do think it's the one that was held by Jesus. His was a healing way. And whether or not there are cures along the way, the point is the healing path he offers, a path that pushes us truly to see ourselves and others in both our frailty and our strength. Knowing there's no cure for being human, but trusting this path will make us more whole. Amen. I invite you to join me in a moment of meditation.
It is now the time in our service when we share our deep joys and concerns, silently or out loud with God and with one another. I'll share some of those we've already received, plus any posted in the chat room, acknowledging that our Tuesday prayer email has all of your other requests. God, hear our healing prayers for the three-day-old grandson of John H.'s friend who had surgery for a perforated bowel last week, for John S. as he recovers from surgery, Michael's sister Krista, who's entered hospice care, and for her husband Bob and son Nate, and for all who are dealing with long-term health concerns and diagnoses. God, hear our prayers for Rose's family as they mourn the loss of her brother, the many school children who were abducted in Nigeria on Friday, Emily S. as she mourns the loss of her beloved Mowgli, an immediate and permanent ceasefire in Gaza, and a just peace in Palestine, Israel, all those in Gaza, Israel, Sudan, Ukraine, and elsewhere who are in harm's way, all who are grieving the loss of loved ones, and anyone anywhere who is sick or grieving or in need. Does anyone have a concern you would like to share? Raise your hand and Sam will bring the microphone. Dorothy? I want to ask for prayers for a longtime church member, Anna Hubis, or church friend, Anna Hubis, who's also a member of our bridge group. She had to fly back to El Salvador a few days ago because her uncle is very sick and, and uh, she asks that we add her to our prayer list. Thank you, Dorothy. I also want to add a joy for the beautiful flowers that David has put on the altar. Absolutely, yes. Other concerns? Carol. It's all prayers for my friend Rita, whose husband Wayne died this past week and also prayers for Tim and his family. He's in the end stages of his life. They will be in our prayers, Carol, thank you. Any other concerns? All right, we'll go to Joy's. God, we give thanks for David's flowers, our congregation's March birthdays, and all those who devote their lives to creating peace, joy, and justice in this world. Other joys. Let us pray. Loving God. Oh, Nick, you have a joy. All right. Yes. Oh, and also John has a joy. Okay, I'm sorry I didn't see uh, these hands. Joy, joy of finally getting out to uh, the Lake Tahoe area to visit my son Ben and daughter-in-law and get a couple days of skiing in and that uh, after the blizzards. <laughs> Had a Fabulous. wonderful time. Oh, I'm so glad. And no injuries, obviously. No injuries, that's good too, absolutely. Nick? So, um, uh, 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 Rachel and uh, Mike Man's um, uh, granddaughter was recently a uh, born her name is uh Allison she was born just yesterday uh a um so uh yeah wonderful that's great news thank you Nick 
Any other joys? Let us pray. Loving God, listen to the prayers of your people. Comfort and nourish us in both our joys and our concerns, spoken or unspoken, and hold us tenderly as we face the many different experiences that life and being human can bring. Holy and gracious Spirit, we are grateful for your presence as we move into this new week, a time that will bring forth its own sorrows and joys. Remind us to hold one another in love and prayer, reaching out as we are able to lend a hand, offer support, or share in celebration. We give thanks for the blessing of this congregation in our lives and pray that we might be a blessing to others in return. In your compassionate name, amen. I invite you to hold all of these joys and concerns in your heart as our choir shares their musical offering.
Thank you so much, choir. That was beautiful. This is the time in our service when we receive the offering in grateful appreciation for the life and work of this beloved community. This morning, Harold will play a hymn during our collection and you're welcome to join in. We'll sing verses one and three. As Lisa said earlier, four times a year, we take up a special offering for one of the ministries and missions of our denomination, the United Church of Christ. This morning, I invite you to support the UCC's work helping people in crisis. Our denomination partners with international organizations such as Church World Service and Global Ministries to provide sources of clean water, food, education, healthcare, microcredit, advocacy, resettlement, emergency relief, and rehabilitation. Please give what you can by writing a check to our church with one great hour of sharing or OGHS in the memo line, or you can contribute via our donation link, which Don Tishy has kindly put in a one great hour of sharing offering or option. If you're in the sanctuary, you may contribute as the offering plate is passed or take out your phone and scan the QR code on the back of your worship bulletin. You can also scan the QR code on the sign at the back of the sanctuary. For those on Zoom, the link to our donate page is in the chat room. And I offer you thanks for all your gifts of time, money, energy, and spirit. standing in body and or spirit as you are able for our closing hymn, Commission and Sung Benediction.
Oh God, this morning as we go forth into a world that is so in need of healing, may we see ourselves as both the healers and those also in need of being healed. And may we be part of that great and never-ending movement toward wholeness.